When you think of creepypasta, what comes to mind? The Russian sleep experiment? Ben Drowned? Slenderman? A tale of a corrupted ROM hack that turns a beloved hero into a twisted villain. A series of blog posts that document several cave explorers slowly slipping into madness. These stories are written and designed for virality. Innocuous images and recounts of expressionless creatures, fake gods, and stolen TV broadcasts captivate millions. Today, in an attempt to spread some Halloween cheer, we're going to take a dive into the history and legacy of two infamous fallout creepypastas. Now, before I get any further, you should know that you should always stay safe online, especially when researching scary and creepy stories. And you can do that with NordVPN. As someone who often scripts, writes, and researches video topics at my local university, NordVPN allows me to stay safe online while using public Wi-Fi with only a single click. You can even enable auto-connect so that it actually takes zero clicks. It's that easy. NordVPN has over 5,900 servers across 59 countries. As such, you'll always be able to find one that fits your needs. Perhaps a server close by for better speeds, or one in a different country to access geo-blocked websites. Nord's advanced threat protection transforms it from a VPN to a powerful cybersecurity tool. You don't even have to be connected to a server to make use of it. Just enable it through the desktop app, and bam, you're now protected from malicious files, website trackers, and those annoying autoplay ads on websites. And outside of how easy it is to use and their advanced cybersecurity tools, as one who games, a gamer if you will, Nord allows me to maintain a stable ping, keeping my gaming experience running smoothly. Make the right decision and join me and millions of other NordVPN users today. Get NordVPN's two-year plan and four extra months free using my link in the description and pinned comment. Use nordvpn.com nord to take advantage of this limited time offer. Heck, it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Let's start at the beginning. What is a creepypasta? Well, the phrase is a combination of the words creepy and copypasta, a term used to describe phrases that are to be copied and pasted across the internet, most oftenly used to annoy people. The 300 confirmed kills Navy SEALs one is likely the most common and well known. Put these two words together and you now have creepypasta, horror stories that are created to go viral, to be shared and spread across the internet, to incite fear in those who read or hear about them. Now because of this copy-paste nature, Determining the exact origins of this unique form of online storytelling is quite difficult. Writers, artists, and other creatives were posting anonymously across the web, and these scary stories were constantly being reposted as well. Hey, did you hear about the guy who explored the abandoned Disney resort? My friend showed it to me yesterday. Because of this, tracking the exact dates of when some of these stories were first created, and who the exact person who created them, is quite a difficult task. We do know that many originated from various image hosting and message board websites. Slenderman started on a something awful forum, the backroom started on 4chan. But this inability to track down and confirm when some of these stories started was part of the fun and added to the believability. Siren Head, Jeff the Killer, Red Mist, these became internet urban legends. And just like how Ben Drowned and MARIO became infamous creepy stories within their respective gaming communities, so too did two Fallout creepypastas. Let's go over them. The first is the Fallout 3 Numbers Station. Sometime around the mid-2010s, about a year and a half after the release of the game, a black image with some green text began making its way around forums and image boards. The post was a detailed theory about how Fallout 3 was predicting the future. It reads, Fallout 3 contains several in-game radio stations. The most diverse and important station is Galaxy News Radio. Many players of the Evil Persuasion know that you can kill Three Dog and he will be replaced by the technician Margaret. She is not a charismatic person and has very little to say, seeming to not enjoy her new announcing duties. She also never appears in person and therefore cannot be killed. Once Three Dog is dead, you're stuck with Margaret. What most players do not know is that under certain circumstances, GNR will become a numbers station. A numbers station is a station that broadcasts an unusual coded message. Many of these exist in real life and some hypothesize that they are a nuclear retaliation control network. Simply check Wikipedia for more information about these odd broadcasts as they relate to the real world. Back to Fallout 3. No one is really sure which actions are needed to hear the numbers station in Fallout 3. It appears that you must kill 3Dog, because no one has reported hearing the number station with him still alive. 
It also appears that you have to skip over the quest Galaxy News Radio, where you help boost the signal so that the station can be broadcast further than just the immediate DC area. This is easy enough to do with either a speech check or simply using the Fallout wiki to look up where to go next and advance the main plot. Finally, you definitely have to destroy Raven Rock. This is actually the trigger to turn GNR into a numbers station, and it will remain as such for the rest of the game. However, the vast majority of the players who perform these actions will still continue hearing the standard GNR broadcasts, so there must be several more requirements the community has yet to isolate. If you're lucky enough to have hit upon the right set of circumstances, just after destroying Ravenrock, you will get the message, radio signal lost, and a few seconds later, radio signal found. You cannot, however, actually listen to GNR just yet, because you didn't boost the signal and are out of range of the broadcast at the exit of Ravenrock. Luckily, Ravenrock is situated in the mountains and is right near one of the few places outside DC that you can get high enough to catch the signal. So far, the confirmed locations to hear the GNR number station are within the immediate DC area, obviously. This is true for the regular GNR throughout the game, at the top of the Ferris wheel at Point Lookout. On the tops of some of the SATCOM arrays you can climb in the northwestern part of the map. On the roof of Tenpenny Tower, though this may be within normal broadcast range anyway, feel free to playtest and get back to me on this. On the highest point of the broken bridge around Arfu, again, maybe within broadcast range anyway. On some of the highest points of the mountaintops in the area near Raven Rock, this is obviously your easiest chance to first listen to the number station. When you tune in, you will hear an old familiar voice, Three Dog, despite the fact that you killed him earlier. However, you will quickly notice that he does not seem to be in character. So I guess it's not technically Three Dog, but just the voice actor, Eric Dellums. He reads a series of numbers in a monotone, depressed sounding voice. He always recites a list of single digits between 9 and 12 characters long. For example, 9379172034. He never uses a multi-digit number like 11 or 40. These numbers are followed by widely varying lengths of Morse code. This is then followed by the song, I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire. All other music tracks seem to be inactive on the number station. The Morse code was the easiest part of the mystery to crack, as the code is widely available and many people actually know it off by heart. We quickly had a list of a great number of messages in English, some sounded completely mundane and even comical, such as, wash the car today, maybe Chinese for dinner, or have you watched my YouTube video yet? I uploaded myself kicking bums in the nuts. You may be saying, but wait, YouTube doesn't exist in the Fallout universe, and you are right. As far as we could tell, all of the messages sounded like they were based in our reality somewhere near the present day. Some of the messages, however, are quite sinister, such as, the queen has died today, the world mourns, as on days like these, we are all Brits. Or, I can't believe they've actually done it. Not long left, the noise. I can't take the noise anymore. I have a pistol in the attic. Just recently, a player on the wiki forums noticed a message that brought to light the meaning of the messages. He was reading a thread that collected all known messages transposed from Morse to English, and saw the line, 120552820, what are you talking about? You'll be missed. He realized this referred to the recent death of Gary Coleman, and then quickly realized the numbers were the time and date of the death. He immediately scanned through the messages to try and find more examples of this apparent future telling by a game that's more than a year old. The next message he read shocked him and pushed him to enlist the aid of others to decipher the code. The message was 9454202010, accident in the gulf, several dead, oil spill apparently averted. He realized this was the BP explosion and the erroneous day one assessment that the well was not leaking. From this point on, all numbers will be transcribed as dates and times. All times were given in game in military format and remain so in this document. Numerous members of the Fallout Wiki message board began looking over the messages to see what else we could learn. We quickly found out that most of the dates were after the game had been released, yet oddly some were from the past. 2215, April 15th, 1865. He's dead, and blame will probably be placed on that actor Booth. Johnson better not cheat me out of my payment. This shed new doubt on the official version of the Lincoln assassination. 
As the community quickly started piling up interpretations of the messages, the mods of the site summarily banned everyone who had posted in or even read the thread. All reference to the number station was removed from the Fallout wiki and filtering software was put in place to prevent reposting of any relevant information. A few people, however, are trading emails and slowly finishing the translation of the remaining messages and putting dates to the existing ones. The Queen died today, the world mourns, as on days like these, we are all Brits, 402, March 19th, 2014. Have you watched my YouTube video yet? I uploaded myself kicking bums in the nuts. 2416, December 24th, 2012. I can't believe Britney's actually won an Oscar. 2133, February 27th, 2023. I can't believe they've actually done it. Not long left. They were warned, but they just had to keep pushing the boundaries of science. The noise. I can't take the noise anymore. And the light. Dear God. The universe is slowly unraveling around us. I'm not going to wait for death. I have a pistol in the attic. This is actually the only message not preceded by a string of numbers. It may be worth noting that the latest date on any of the messages is 127, July 6th, 2027. And that's the story of the Fallout 3 number station, a secret radio broadcast hidden behind several in-game actions, some known, others unknown. The voice actor for 3Dog recites a string of numbers, Morse code plays, and then the ink spots I don't want to set the world on fire plays. These messages are supposed phrases that predict future events in our real world. I think what makes Number Station a great copypasta is how believable it is. The story about a group of video game easter egg hunters piecing together this grandiose theory about how Fallout 3 is predicting the future. The way in which it is worded is very similar to those long fan theory posts that you might find nowadays about Fallout 4's secret underwater ghoul whale or GTA 5's Mount Chiliad secret. During my research, I've even seen some people claim it to still be true as late as 2020. If that's not sign of its great believability, I don't know what is. The story is a greatly written creepypasta. The story's presentation is removed enough where we're not hearing one person's creepy encounter in a game, like how many creepypastas are, no. We're hearing about a collective community's experience trying to solve this supposed Fallout 3 mystery. Like if one person has a paranormal encounter, there will be a lot of skepticism. But if an entire forum experiences the same thing, well, then there might be a bit of merit to the claim. So yes, while the entire story is made up, whoever did write it did a great job adding to the believability of it. And even if a games radar journalist reached out to Bethesda and confirmed the story was fake in August of 2010, there are many people who still ponder if the number station truly does exist. After all, it would surely be in Bethesda's best interest to lie and say that of course they can't predict the future. Though if they could, surely they would have fixed 76's poor launch. Nah, but seriously, the number station has got to be the most infamous Fallout creepypasta. On to one that is definitely more gruesome, even if it is a tad bit more obscure. Sometime in 2012, another image with text began being spread around various Fallout boards and forums. The post claimed that the abandoned Lone Wolf Radio Shack in Fallout New Vegas initially wasn't abandoned. The creator of the image claimed that it was originally home to a man known as the Lone Wolf. The story reads, Lone Wolf Radio Shack in Fallout New Vegas appears to be abandoned, but that was not always the case. Originally, it was planned to be home of the Lone Wolf, a character far more sadistic and depraved than any before featured in the Fallout franchise. He was planned to host the Lone Wolf radio station, which would feature insane ramblings and rants at unpredictable intervals throughout the day, until 11pm when the station would go quiet. The Lone Wolf would return at 3am with a child, a different child featured every night. The Lone Wolf would announce on air every night, everyone is gone, you are all alone, let it all end before viciously unaliving them live on the station. Listening to the broadcast at 3am would initiate a quest, Little Dead Riding Hood, in which the courier has to track down the wolf and kill him or join him in unaliving a child, resulting in a perk that would allow the player to unalive other children in game. Accessing the child unalive option was supposed to be very difficult to achieve. The perk, quest, and character were ultimately scrapped due to their shocking nature, plus the sheer effort required to record a unique murder for every night until the quest is complete. However, somewhere in Obsidian's archives there exist recordings made for the Lone Wolf radio station, including simulated child murders, never to be released. All that remains in the final game is a small, abandoned shack and small clues hidden throughout the Mojave. The story of the Lone Wolf Radio Shack then led to some follow-up tales about people discovering a mod that re-implemented the Little Dead Riding Hood quest. 
They would play through these ominous and freaky mods, usually be met with some paranormal or creepy encounter. You know, bloody face, killer in the window, mom doesn't have chicken tendies, that kind of thing. You know what I mean. The spin-offs are never nearly as good as the original. Anyway, at the time, there was this rumored belief that some sick obsidian developer created this grotesque character quest and perk, but ultimately became cut content due to its depravity. I believe that the simply uncut New Vegas mod actually implements a quest called Little Dead Riding Hood based on the Lone Wolf creepypasta. Due to the mod's name, one might think that it is indeed cut content from New Vegas, but the mod's description on Nexus mods puts the quest under the header, things added that are not cut content. And spoiler alert in case you hadn't realized yet, there was never a Little Dead Riding Hood quest in Fallout New Vegas, ever. Not cut content, just a creative creepypasta. When asked about Lone Wolf Radio on a Twitch Q&A in 2016, Josh Sawyer said, It's completely made up. All that stuff about Lone Wolf Radio is completely made up. Denise McMurray, the location designer, had this to say about the location in 2012. It was there to serve as an abandoned location to find tech-based materials. Nothing official story-wise. I figured there was probably at least one crazy person near Vegas who would have had their own pirate radio station. It was the lone wolf against the world, government, etc. The guy who always has some conspiracy theory going on that he has to share with the world. The inspiration for it came from when I was at the University of Oregon. Every Saturday night there was a guy who stood on the corner of the campus where everyone walked by. He had a personal microphone and speaker and would just babble on about one government conspiracy theory or the other. The Radio Shack was what I imagine he would have put together if he upgraded from travel speaker to pirate radio. Some theorize that the location was implemented to serve as an easy way for the game testers to fix EDE as all the required parts can be found at the location and it is in close proximity to Prim. Most likely case, it's just an interesting piece of environmental storytelling. While I think the believability of the Lone Wolf Radio is much less than that of the numbers station, the sheer creepiness is much greater. While every game ever made likely has their share of cut content, Fallout cut content is infamous as the developers release their game editor for free to the community. This allows people to scour and scrutinize the game's files looking for anything that had never been fully implemented prior to the game's release. This sort of storytelling about someone finding something interesting in the game files was compelling as there was and still is great interest by people who want to know what was left out of these games. Not everyone has the patience or ability to look through the GEC editor for themselves. Whether they don't know how to or don't have access to a PC, it doesn't matter. People want to know what didn't make the final cut. So hearing about some twisted quest that never made the final version of Fallout New Vegas was interesting, and as previous Fallout titles had included the ability to unalive children, there was a small amount of merit to the creepypasta. Though due to some controversy surrounding Fallout 2, and Bethesda's past gameplay decisions regarding children, it was kind of a no-brainer that something like this would have never been implemented, let alone worked on. You know, why spend hours writing and developing a quest if it'll just get your game an adult-only rating by the ESRB and banned in several countries? You're just wasting time and money at that point. Although the story of the Lone Wolf has been debunked, going there in-game still creeps me out for one reason or another. It's just ominous. And I suppose that that's the legacy the Lone Wolf Radio Creepypasta has left behind. And that is the tale of Fallout's two most infamous creepypastas. If you like this sort of video, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more creepy Fallout content, let me know in the comments. Have a happy Halloween and a good rest of your day. Cheers. Until next time, this is Three Dog, Ow! and you're listening to Galaxy News Radio, bringing you the truth, no matter how bad it hurts.